tell you something, sermon preparation, especially um, holiday sermon preparation, is, is both a joy and a challenge. Let me tell you, you have to enter into a, a, a meditative state, you have to med- enter into a, um, a prayerful state, you have to find this balance between being analytical and studious, but also being creative. And I, I love it. <laughs> I, I absolutely love it. But the main idea is you have to um, find what the Holy Spirit of God wants you to prepare and present to His people. Amen. And you have to just trust God to do that. And you have to filter out the flesh and you have to filter out the world. And especially around the holidays, you have to... To, to be balanced in the way you deal with expectations, uh, like your expectations and other people's expectations. And so the reason why I'm going through all this is just to, to praise God for the power of His Holy Spirit. You guys know that I, um, I actively cultivate uh, an appreciation for language, specifically words, because I, I, believe that, I believe very strongly that our internal and external dialogue the, the way we describe and the words we use to describe our beliefs and our experiences, they will either improve the way we feel and function in life, or they will corrupt the way we feel and function in life. And so, with all that being said, it shouldn't be surprising that um, while brainstorming for this holiday sermon series, I asked the question, just kind of in passing, Without any real expectation of an answer, I thought, well, I wonder if, if there's a word study or if there was a text that, you know, word specific and focused that, that maybe I could do. And, and I, honest to God, I, it was just kind of a passing thought. And I can say that after 20 years of um, preparing sermons, I have learned to recognize and respond to the word of the Lord. Turn to Isaiah chapter 9. Isaiah chapter 9, we're going to focus and, and spend several weeks just digesting one verse, and uh, I hope that, uh, and I pray that you will find it as exciting and encouraging and as nourishing as I have, and for you holiday people, yes, it's a holiday text. So, uh, Isaiah chapter 9, let's read together verse number 6, which says this, For unto us a child is born. Unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Let's unpack some of these words that the prophet Isaiah used to describe Jesus, and let's see if there's anything in there that might help us improve the way we feel and function this Christmas season, shall we? Well... We're going to chew on every word in the verse. You guys should come to expect that, right? But uh, there is a list, and so the first word in the list is the word wonderful. Now, in order to get a good bite on the word wonderful, you have to first think about the word wonder. Wonder. That word describes a state or feeling of at least a little bit of surprise mixed with a lot of happiness. It is usually caused by something unexpected or something inexplicably good. Wonder. So to be called wonderful is to be described, and again, I work hard to kind of condense things. I think wonderful means shockingly good. Think about that for a second. There's got to be at least a little bit of shock, a little bit of surprise in order for it to be wonder. But it's got to be good. It's got to be really good. So, is Jesus wonderful? Now, you know in here, we don't stay on the surface. We're asking, is he really wonderful? Is it accurate to describe Jesus as being surprisingly or shockingly good? You know, I imagine we could do a whole series just on this word, but... Since this is Christmas, and since the text does say, unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, let's dig into some of the, the wonders of the Incarnation. And by the way, Incarnation is just a $10 word for God coming to earth by becoming man. 
By the way, Christians, come on. Look, look, I, I hope that within our community, we are educated enough and trained enough that when people come al along and they start throwing out $10 words like, let us meditate upon the incarnation, we just know what that means. And we don't go, oh, wait a minute, what was that? Where's my book? You know what I mean? Incarnation is God choosing to become man. That's it. Clear as mud, everybody got it? Gracie, we got it? Yeah. Good to go. Okay. I'm trying to find it in my Bible. Isaiah 9, 6. So, so as we contemplate this, first of all, I have basically three points. And first of all is this. It is a wonder that he came. Pause and think about that. It is surprisingly, shocking, shockingly good that God came. Now, some of you Bible scholars are going to say, well, wait a minute. It shouldn't be surprising or shocking at all because he said that he was going to come. As a matter of fact, the very text that you're reading was written roughly 700 years before he actually came. And there were older texts than that. And so, should it really be shocking and surprising that Jesus came? Let me ask you simply this. Have you ever been shocked? Or surprised yeah. when someone, even someone who was reliable, actually did what they said they were going to do. You ever had that happen? Let that sink in. You know, it's not uncommon for us to be disappointed. It's not uncommon for people to say they're going to do something, and then when they do it, it's like, okay, well, I, I, I guess they at least tried. But when God came... Yeah, he said he was going to come. But it was shockingly, surprisingly good that God, yeah, that God, the one who said, let there be light, the creator of the universe, all-powerful, all-knowing, eternal. Are you there? Are you in your head? Are you trying to contemplate an infinite God choosing in a moment to be a dual cell in a woman's womb? I don't know about you. That's shocking. That's hard for me to get my head wrapped around. That God chose to put himself... And limit himself to set aside his glory, to set aside his power, and to become an infant in a child. Now again, Bible scholars like to debate, when did the deity of Christ actually become, and blah, blah, blah. You know what I think it happened? When the Holy Spirit was conceived in her womb. Amen. I think it was nine months before she was delivered. He was delivered. Are you there? What? Why would God do that? Couldn't God have chosen to insert his deity into this baby? Yes. And maybe he did, but there's no theological reason for us to believe that he did. He went through it. He wanted to experience every single part of what it means to be human. So that he could say, I've been there, I've been through it all, I know. That is shocking to me. That is surprising to me. He could have cut corners. He could have done any number of different things. But he came. My friends, that's wonderful. Shockingly, surprisingly good. Not just that he came, but how he came. The text says, unto us a child is born. Could Jesus have just decided that, okay, um, I will... Part the clouds, and there will be trumpets, and there will be angels, and, and I will step out of the eternal dimension into this temporal dimension, and I will march down on the clouds, and, and, uh, and anybody who dares to oppose me, I will just do the whole Darth Vader and say, oh yeah, you can't breathe, can you? Oh, okay, now shut up. C could God have done that? Yes. yes. Yeah, he could have shut up, and it would have just been plain and simple, this is God, all hail Everyone get on your face. God could have done that. He didn't do that, did he? He didn't do that. <laughs> you think that maybe the social, religious, or political elite of the day were surprised or shocked at how he came? I find it interesting when you look at Matthew chapter 2, the wise men from the east, 
they were shocked and surprised that the elite weren't paying attention. Uh, Where's he born the king of Jews? There was a star. <laughs> what, what are you guys doing? They were shocked because they had been following. And there's a very, very important lesson to learn, learn here. Five and a half miles, folks. Five and a half miles. That's how far Jerusalem, the seat of power. Those who were entrusted with political power, those who were entrusted with religious power, social power, those who were supposed to know every jot and tittle of the law, those who should have seen it coming, were five and a half miles from Jesus when he came. Now, you look at that from two different perspectives. Five and a half miles is not far, is it? No. Would you travel five and a half miles to see Jesus? Amen. Yeah. Well, back in that day, five and a half miles was still less than a day's journey. You could get there by noon. They were, it, it happened right under their very nose, and yet those who were supposed to be closest to the Messiah were the farthest away from him. Let that one sink in. Why? Why? Because of how he came. I'm so tempted to get off my notes here. Have you ever been shocked or surprised at what God was doing in your life? Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. Have you ever been tempted to believe that it's shockingly and surprisingly bad? what God is doing in your life. That God's will, God's plans, the way that things are playing out are shockingly and surprisingly bad. Isaiah shouldn't have used the word wonderful. He should have said horrible. He shall be called horrible, terrible. Because when God shows up in your life, oh, it's going to be bad. No, it's probably designed to shock people out of their complacency. Probably designed in a way to shock us out of our arrogance. It's prop, God is probably going to show up in your life the same way he showed up on this earth in a way that says, Hey, you need to come to me. And not because I'm going to make you. Not because I'm going to pull, you know, use my force powers on you and make you submit. He was a baby, powerless. He wants us to love him. How about that? We don't get it. I'm just going to say it right here from behind the pulpit. We, we, we don't. We, we're not letting it sink in. And you good to go? I knew you would be. You're in a church that loves you. Everybody's like, oh, is Annie okay? She's fine. So, <clears throat> we don't get it. We respond to power. We respond to money. We respond to glory. We respond. When our boss tells us to be there, when some, you know, when, when the, the, the lights and the badge and all this stuff shows up and forces us, we respond. When our parents who love us, when our spouse who loves us, when a teacher who's not getting paid beans, they do it because they love you. When other people just love their country, love their community, love their spouse, love their kids, say, this is the right thing, you need to do it. We turn up our nose. My friends, Jesus came the way he did for a reason. It's to teach us to respond to love, to respond to people who are committed to do what is best for us. Amen. We should pay attention to that. Why? Because it's wonderful. Shockingly, amazingly good. That the person with all the power chose to use none of the power. By the way, is there a lesson in that? To just say, hey, I love you. Here I am. So, the fact that he came, the way that he came was wonderful. But neither of those things hold a candle to uh, why he came. One, one quick thing. I, I, I don't want to skip over this. You know, one of the things that I love about my wife is that she's an explorer. 
we've lived a couple different places since we've been married, and in every different place we've lived, she makes it her business to know the good spots in the area. We've had the privilege of taking people uh, who have lived their whole lives in a specific area to some restaurant or attraction or some site or something that they didn't even know was there. Why? Because Annie makes that her business. Christians, that's our business. To help other people, maybe even people who've been saved their whole life, or go to church their whole life, recognize the things that are wonderful, shockingly, surprisingly good about God, about God's Word. Amen? Amen? He shall be called wonderful. And so if we are going to be to follow in His footsteps, we should seek that as well. So, again, the fact that he came, the way that he came were wonderful, shockingly, surprisingly good, but you guys know where I'm going with this, right? Neither of those things hold a candle to why he came. In Luke 19.10, Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which is lost. You ever been lost? Uh, I think we're spoiled even that way. Most of us, if we look back on a time in our life where we were lost, we were children, and there was a mom and a dad frantically looking for us. Isn't that true? If you're lost, probably someone frantically looking for you. you know, unfortunately, there are some people who don't have moms and dads and friends and family who are looking for them. They don't care. There are people right now who are wandering this world and they are lost in their heart, they are lost in their head, they are lost in their career, they're just lost, they're wandering. Let me tell you something, God is after those people. And if God's after those people, we're supposed to be after those people. Jesus came to seek and to save the people who were lost. In John chapter 10, verse 10, Jesus said that He was come, that they might have life, that they might have it more abundantly. I don't know about you, that sounds wonderful to me. He didn't come just to dominate and say, all right, now that I'm the king, I'm going to set up everything and in and, and some sort of socialist, communist, all right, you get this and you get this and I'll have this. Is that how God did it? No, he came and he had less so that you and I could have more. Think about that. That's, that's the opposite of what almost all human authorities on the planet do. Isn't that true? He came to have less so that you could have more. That's wonderful. That's the way it's supposed to be. That's why Jesus came to teach us, to show us how we're supposed to be. He came to suffer and die on a cross. You know, when you think about the cross, when you think about what Jesus suffered, it's really heavy on the surprising and the shocking. But you have to understand the why in order for you to call it good. You know, one of the disciplines that I try to maintain in prayer is to actively engage my imagination. You ever struggle to pray? My only one. Yeah, you ever say, all right, all right, I'm supposed to pray, what do I say, I, I don't know what to do, and, and I'm just kind of going through the motions, and you say a couple words. When I pray, I try to actively engage my imagination, and I'm supposed to start by praising Him and worshiping Him. And I meditate on words like creator, and in my mind's eye, I go through seven days of creation. Epic, movie style, right? I see it happen in a second. Water, light, land. It, and I, I just watch it happen. And in my mind's eye, I am, I am in awe of knowing that he's the one that did that. This was God making the world. That's wonderful. He's the creator. He's the savior. And 
my mind's eye, when I'm trying to pray and I'm trying to get myself into a place where God can make me what I'm supposed to be, when I'm trying to get myself into a place where God can use me to build other people to where they need to be, which is a privilege and an honor, amen? I engage my imagination in the reason that He came, and I think about who and what He was as the Savior. And I can see Him in that garden. And I can, I can see Him disrespected, spit on, I can see him putting a crown of thorns on his head. I can see him flaying his back. I can, tell. I can see him struggling with his emotions. I can see him praying. I can see him and know that somewhere in his infinite mind is me. I can see him being nailed to a cross. I can see him wrestling with his own power knowing that he could come down at any moment. I can see him wrestling with an enemy screaming in his ear saying, is it going to work for that person? Is it going to work for that person? No, you know they're going to go to hell. You're going to hang there anyway. When I'm trying to pray, I engage my mind and I can see this. And it brings my sin into perspective. It brings me into perspective. And there's the, the, the only rational responses. <laughs> me? You did that for me. Amen. That doesn't make sense. That's a horrible thing to happen, but it is the best thing that could have happened for me. Because without it, what do I get? Hell. Isn't that true? And so by His stripes we are healed. It's a wonderful, it's shockingly, it's surprising that you would call that good, but it, it is, isn't it? You're supposed to end your prayer with a Y of yield. Did Isaiah know what the Lord looked, up, looked like when he was high and lifted up, king? Yeah. Yes, he did. Do you? Do you ever take the time in prayer before you get up and go off and go do what you're going to do to pause and think about who it is that you belong to, who it is that wrote this book, who it is that has expectations for you? You are his son. You are his daughter. And he bled and died on a cross just to get you to love him back. Amen. You know... To call that wonderful is an understatement, isn't it? It's an understatement. Have you ever gone out of your way, spent a lot of time, spent a lot of money, spent a lot of effort for someone else, maybe a stranger, maybe a relative, maybe a child, who refuses to acknowledge you or what you've done? Ever had that happen? How does that make you feel? You ever felt that kids these days just don't appreciate what they have? Kids these days just don't appreciate how good they have it. You ever felt that? <laughs> yeah. Have you ever found yourself thinking or feeling something like, Yay, a tree with lights on it. Yay, a whole month with heightened expectations, demanding unrealistic expectations to... Spend money, travel, gather with other people, and of course, we've got to be married. You ever struggle with that? You ever found yourself feeling something like, you know, I just don't feel the wonder anymore. It's just a tree like it was last year and the year before. Just decorations like <laughs> last year and the year before. It's just going to be another bad tie or another plastic thing or, or it's going to be, you know, turkey and, and we're going to get together and we're going to tolerate Uncle Fred and, and we're going to, you know, do this and we're going to do that. And 
Yay. You ever feel like, well, I guess I've just outgrown Christmas, and I just, you know, the wonder's not there for me anymore. Y'all can look at me like that all you want. I know I'm not the only one. Does the Bible have anything to say about that? If you wanted to feel that way, could you? If you wanted to. Are there reasons for you? Maybe we've mentioned them today. Are there things that could put you into a state of wonder concerning the Christmas season? If you wanted to feel shockingly, surprisingly good, could you if you wanted to? If that's what your husband or your wife needed from you, if that's what your kids or your grandkids needed from you, if that's what your mother-in-law or father-in-law or grandma who's worked so hard and they're just hoping that that time at their home will be good, could you do that if that's what was needed? Come on, church. You could if you wanted to. And it's not maturity to walk in and out of that and say, yeah, a tree, yeah, a tree. That doesn't make you grown up and mature. That makes you immature. That makes you just a crotchety stick in the mud. Cut it out. Grow up. Get with the program. Keep your heart with all diligence. Amen. Recognize that just as he is called wonderful, we're supposed to acknowledge him as wonderful. And we're supposed to try to reflect that. Preaching up here. So, would you? Would you describe Jesus as wonderful? Shockingly, surprisingly good. If, you, if you're answering right now in some sort of shallow, well, yeah, you just got done talking about it. Listen, I want to encourage you. I want to give you a homework assignment. Chew on that word some more. How is he shockingly and surprisingly good to you? Not me, not us, you. How has God been shocking and surprisingly good to you? And I would encourage you to spend time this week chewing on that. You know, I'm convinced that as we contemplate and meditate on the fact that He wasn't just wonderful, He is wonderful. I imagine that that might have an impact on the way you feel. I imagine that that would have an impact on the way you would function this holiday season. What do you think? I don't know. I think maybe that could be wonderful. How about you? Heads bowed, eyes closed, no one looking around. I just want to ask you a question. Just a simple question. It's a rhetorical question. I'm not asking you to raise your hand. I'm not asking you to run down here. I'm asking you this. Are you keeping your heart in a way that is appropriate for Christmas? Are you guarding and tending your heart in a way that is appropriate for this holiday season? Be careful. When I had to answer this question honestly, my answer was no. And I had to repent. I had some changing and growing to do. And I suspect you do as well. Heavenly Father, we come to you humbly, thanking you and praising you for your mercy and your grace. Lord, as we've discussed, as we can imagine, as we read in your word, Lord, you truly are wonderful in what you've done and in what you're doing and in what you have in store for us, the plans that you have for us. And yet, Lord, every one of us has to confess that we fall short of your glory. We allow things into our heart that have no business there. We fail to take the steps, do the things, listen to the worship music, read the Bible, have the conversations, make the priorities necessary to feel and function the way that you would have us to feel and function. God, I pray that you'd help us to repent of this. God, I pray that you'd help us to recognize the importance of this holy day 
this holy season. God, I pray that we would recognize how important it is to shine a light that would encourage and instruct and inspire our family and our friends. And that we would be mindful of the fact that there are people who are lost and depressed and broken and desperately need to see a light this holiday season. God, make that light out of us. God, we love you and we praise you. We thank you. We're counting on you. In your name we pray.